Welcome to MICE 2019, our 10th year. Thank you for coming. Um, I also want to especially thank Leslie Art and Design, um, who has hosted uh, MICE for all the 10 years of its existence. So thank you. I'd also like to tell you that MICE is produced by the Boston Comic Arts Foundation, or BCAF. Um, BCAF is a 501c3 charitable organization um, that we started a few years ago so that we could make MICE a nonprofit, um, but we gave it a, a, a grander name so that we could expand the mission beyond MICE to support, encourage, and nurture the art of independent comics uh, in the Boston area and beyond. Um, we are supporting and assisting with several newer shows, including the Boston Kids Comics Fest, which will have its third uh, event this spring. Uh, the Comics in Color, uh, and there will be the first Comics in Color Festival also coming up in spring 2020. Um, and Pod Tales, which is in fact a dramatic podcast uh, expo, which is happening right next door at Lunder Hall uh, today for the first time. So um, if you like uh, dramatic podcasts, I strongly encourage you to run and check that out. And um, BCAF and MICE, uh, willingly accepts and welcomes uh, donations to help us with our missions. Uh, uh, you can go to the miceexpo.org website or talk to anyone uh, at the welcome desk here if you'd like to donate to mice, uh, to BCAF or MICE or become a MICE sponsor if you're uh, so inclined. Um, so with that, um, we can move on to the, uh, the, the comics visual literacy uh, panel, which I'm very excited about, and I think it'll be great. And here is Allison Wilgus, your moderator. Hey, folks. Uh, so the bulk of this panel is going to be our fabulous cartoonists talking about some uh, artwork they've picked out. So I'm going to go through our intro pretty quickly to leave us as much time as possible to talk about comics like giant nerds and enormous amount of depth, <laughs> which I'm assuming that's why you're here. Uh, so I'm going to go right down the line here. First, we have Ellen T. Crenshaw, who is a cartoonist and illustrator for books, editorial, and advertising, comics, and children's media. She was nominated for the 2019 Russ Manning Award for her work in Kiss Number no. 8, and the book was nominated for the 2019 National Book Award in Young People's Literature. Incidentally, that is a very big deal. So congratulations, Ellen. <laughs> uh, next, we have Ashanti Fortson. Uh, who is a cartoonist, illustrator, and colorist with a deep love for kind stories with fantastical settings. Their work explores transience and reflection through a tender-hearted lens, and a good comics essay will always brighten their day. Uh, next, we have Kurt and... I forgot to ask you, Kurt Ankeny? Ankeny, very good. There we go. Is a cartoonist from Wisconsin, currently living in Salem, Massachusetts. His new book, Pleading with Stars, is a collection of the short comic stories he's created over the past five years and is debuting here at MICE this weekend. His work has garnered attention from PEN America, The Comics Journal, Best American Comics, and Boston Book Builders New England Book Show. And finally, we have Ronald Wimberly, who is also a cartoonist. You might be noticing a theme here. Uh, his works include Sentences, Prince of Cats, Black History in Its Own Words, Lighten Up, and Lab Magazine. So this is a really fantastic bunch of people to hear, be here talking about comics with me. Um, I'm Allison Wilgus. I'm also a cartoonist. Um, I'm also a comics editor, so I spend a lot of time talking to people about this stuff. So with no further ado, we're going to start with Kurt who has picked out a few images to discuss with us today. Uh, I'm going to mostly leave this up to you. As you know, um, as you might have noticed if you read the program, Comics Visual Literacy, we're basically going to be talking about uh, the visual language of comics, how we're communicating theme, character, emotion, tone, all kinds of stuff, uh, in a little bit more depth than you might normally get. So ideally, this will be a good time. So, Kurt, we're starting with uh, Skim by Jillian Tamaki and Mariko Tamaki. Um, hello, everyone. Um, so, uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with this book. It's kind of a classic, in my opinion, at this point. Um, you all can hear me? Yeah? yeah. Look at your phone and talk to your will, mic. I will, I will. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it just seems more appropriate to stare at that. Mm -mm. Um, <laughs> so, the reason I uh, chose this page, um, even though there's not really a lot of panel action on it, 
um, is because I feel like it's doing a lot of um, complex emotional storytelling um, in this one image, uh, especially because the the narrative voice, the Dear Diary, and it's snowing, is so at odds with um, the person, the Skim's, um, the Skim's, uh, you know, little message in the snow there. Um, the one of the things that I liked about it was that I feel like there's there's um, there's a couple of different audio signals happening in this um, because when you get like a uh, when you get a dear diary a caption sort of thing I feel like you're, you're getting um, a voice that sort of speaks internally like it feels more immediate in your head when you're when you're reading like a, a caption from a from a character um, but then you've got this this image of her um, uh, writing out this, you know, sort of angsty teenage message in the snow, which is incredibly ephemeral because it's, you know, going to melt eventually. Um, it's, uh, it, she doesn't even get that part of it right. Uh, you know, she's like, I hate you. She crosses out, no, 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 I hate everything. Um, and yet she's writing in her diary and, and all of that is missing. You know, that she's writing in her diary, dear, dear diary, it's snowing. Um, and yet we're getting we're getting so many layers of this. Right? I just just I can't uh, say enough about how interesting, co interestingly complex this this one page is um, for that character to um, to function at so many different levels in that way. And of course, it's you know beautifully drawn by by Jillian Tamaki. And uh, I don't actually know what the I don't know if anybody knows. Um, like how they collaborate. I know that, you know, Mark it's pretty and, opaque, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so we don't know exactly how they collaborate and, you know, if they're tossing ideas back and forth or if they are, however, but, um, just for, uh, especially for two separate people to come up with a scene, this complex and this interesting, um, I think is, is quite amazing. And it's, it's one of, one of the highlights in that book, I feel like. So, um, that's mainly why I chose this page in Next. particular. It's great. Do you guys have any questions about this page, or is, did you want to do that sort of thing, or what? Do you I'm want gonna. To do? I'm vaguely keeping. I just want to make sure we get through everything. So yeah, if yeah, somebody yeah. has something like really urgent in the moment, I encourage our panelists to say something. But otherwise, we're gonna kind of get through the whole thing. Okay. I think. Okay. Cool. All right. So uh, then, this next piece is um, by Noah Van Skyver. This is a little. This is simpler, um, but I feel like it also does an interesting emotional trick where. Um, we're going, he's uh, meeting a friend of his girlfriend who knows nothing about comics, who knows nothing about cartoonists, and he just slowly changes his self-image for the reader into what he's feeling. You know, he turns in, and then there's actually a, a following page to this where he's just sitting alone as the like horrible furry monster sort of uh, crying to himself <laughs> on a couch. Um, but it's, it's something that like is... Um, we know that it's not supposed to be, it's not a representation of reality to the other characters. It's just an internal feeling for um, the, the sort of narrative character. Um, but I feel like this is something that you can only do in comics or, or you could only do it in this way in comics. So it's sort of a simpler gag, um, but I thought that it also had a lot of emotional impact. No. I mostly love the, I feel like Panera Bread was a good touchstone for like, <laughs> this is a normal person conversation. <laughs> yes, exactly. This was me last night talking to my friends about fan fiction, by the way. So. <laughs> um, and then this is a piece of my own, um, and this is also sort of a, a pretty simple gag, but I was pleased with just how the, um, so what I'm after here is just... Um, using the colors to sort of uh, do a, a, I don't want to say it, it's not a bait and switch, but it is sort of like a, a twist at the end um, where, you know, you've got this solitary yellow figure throughout all eight of these panels surrounded by gray, surrounded by, you know, the visual indicators of a rainstorm and just sort of being cold and wet and miserable. And then at the end, just sort of flipping it around so that they're surrounded by yellow. And I've added that little red red key and it just completely changes the the feeling of that um into one warmth and coziness um and just sort of like that that feeling of satisfaction when you're out and you're suddenly back in your shelter 
and, and feeling contained and warm and whatever. So I had one question about this. Uh, yeah. Your choice to have your uh, comic be borderless, mm. what do you feel like that did to the tone of this comic? Mm. Um, I don't know. I don't know if I intended it to be borderless per se, mm -hmm. um, especially because the the gray and the white are so strong against each other. I felt like it didn't need borders, yeah. um, but uh, yeah, it does, does tend to be make it a little more amorphous, a little more messy feeling sometimes, mm -hmm. and it also tends to um, make the visual slightly less crisply delineated. Um, so there is that feeling, like you, when you're out in the rain or whatever, you never know yeah. like when your misery is going to end, I suppose. Ronald, did you have something? This is why I thought this was kind of like a, um, this yeah. particular what's happened Here, just now. Be more, take that yeah, microphone, okay. put that right in front of you. <laughs> what happened just now is kind of like why I, um, I kind of, I was like, wow, this is an interesting problem. By interesting, I meant sort of like thwarting, right? Because I think when you're taught, you, you didn't, what I would have looked at, looking at your work, mm. um, and I think you maybe hinted at, was um, this is framing, right? Like the, the framing of the yellow, right? Mm -hmm. So the smallness of it. Right, 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 you know, yes. Um, and you set up this uh, rhythm of that, right? You have your setup, and then in the final one, you reverse it completely. Right. Like I don't even... The red is almost coincidental to me. Like sure. it's not even, I don't even think of it as being like kind of like the crux of what you're doing because that sort of antagonistic space that surrounds the figure, you know, that gray, all the way up to the final moment when like what's been shielding the figure in, yeah. the, in the prior panels. Right encapsulate and encloses this sort of like misery. The little, the little <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, yeah. and you're right, you're completely <laughs> right about that. But at the same time, when I was making it, it didn't actually work just yellow. Mm. And so the only reason that I emphasize the, the red there mm. is because it it pushed it that much further when I added the red so that the so that the yellow had something to play with mm. to read warmth. Well it's something that's hidden, right? right? Like in it a way it's like of, it's yeah. it's not it's not in the other ones, right? Right, right, right. And right, right. it's something that's hidden that we get to see maybe part of the internal life of the character. That comfort that we couldn't see before. Like I think but yeah that that's brilliant, I think. And the framing, I think it I I can't imagine it with a border for that yeah. reason. Mm. Oh yeah, I, I agree. I just wanted you to explain it. <laughs> <laughs> and part of me feels like... Also, Kurt, I'm gonna come over there and force that microphone in front of you, I swear to I'm God. <laughs> part, of me, part of me feels like somewhere out there, there's you know some comic from Mad Magazine or something that does this exact same trick that I've forgotten all about that I saw mm. way back. Yeah, it's been um, cooking. I just feel like that old, mm -hmm. yeah. that old timey kind of gag, but yeah. anyway, it came out like this. All right, thank you, Kurt. And next we're gonna do the Ashanti. It's their time in the uh, in the spotlight here. All right. <clears throat> this comic is by a friend of mine also, so I'm like, yeah, yeah Siobhan uh, is a genius. I love this comic. Um, so this is the first page of Right, Right, Kill by Shivana Sukdeo. And I love, I love this page. I love this entire comic. But um, for context, this comic is about a writer starting to plagiarize. And this opening page shows us exactly where he is. Um, it tells us so much about his character, about the setup, and through the through the placing of panels in this page, we get a sense of tension, we get a sense of escalation, and that, that ultimately culminates in the 100th rejection letter that he receives. Um, the numbering 94, 95, etc., doesn't isn't necessarily um, obvious what it's referring to at the beginning, but as you see him see, reading these letters, as you see him reacting to these letters, it becomes clear that something is wrong. And it becomes clear that um, through, the, through the numeration and then the rest of the story, we, we understand that these are rejection letters. And um, I think there's just so much, so much good stuff going on here from, from the shaky lines in the, in the border, in the panel borders themselves, and the rest of the inks. Um, telling us about the, telling us through natural uh, line variation and um, 
breaking the panel border as well in the 100th uh, rejection letter, it, it tells us about the character's state of mind. The uh, inclusion of red in the 100th rejection letter, I think, is is so brilliant. It's so striking. Um, the only instance of that red on the page, um, and it it really emphasizes to me at, at the start of the story where we're headed. We're going downhill for the rest of the story in this in this character's mental state. Um, the character drawing and expression as well, I think, really communicates this this escalation that's present in this first page. Um, if you look at the first the first panel, the 94th rejection letter, and you compare that to even 95, 96, 97, et cetera, the lines in his face become so much more pronounced, um, which, of course, tells us his expression, but it just becomes more frantic, more uh, more dense. And in in conjunction with his enraged body language um, and the violent act of tearing up these letters, his his cascading sweat, his poten potential tears, um, and then again culminating in that 100th letter with the yellow of his sclera, completely showing us that he has entered this um, this mental state that is setting the rest the stage for the rest of the comic, where he starts to plagiarize and kill people for their words. Um, the energy on this page, I think, is is phenomenal. Despite and then in a way because of the very structured first four panels, and then the. Uh, the breaking of that structure for the for the 98th, 99th, and the 100th letters, the way those kind of cascade across the page, along with with the um, the shreds of the of the letter itself in the 100th panel, um, I think the use of space here is really smart to communicate that sense of tension, that sense of escalation, present in in all other aspects of this page. I think this this page is a really phenomenal start to the rest of this comic, just completely setting the stage and showing us that all is not right here. Um, I want to get on to your next uh, thing so we have time, yes. but I want to briefly say one, I love how red is meaning the complete opposite thing. We have a red final panel in this for the total opposite reason. Instead of comfort, it's bad, badness. Yes. And also just the distance between the and that the difference in distance between the middle and like this space versus this space yes. is very interesting to me. Completely. And the transition of those shreds, yeah, yeah. Bridging, that, bridging that gap. That's a very small thing. If those th last three panels were evenly spaced, it would not work as well. No, not at all. Yeah, that was really smart. All right. Yeah. Next. OK, this is a page from uh, Beneath the Dead Oak Tree by Emily Carroll. Um, this so the the whole comic is in this verse, which is a super interesting choice. And this page I chose specifically for its pacing. Um, it's using a nine panel grid, but it's it's only including text in um, Carol has only included text in the second, fourth, sixth, and eighth panels, um, establishing this rhythm, this this even rhythm that is. Uh, present in this page, continues on to the next page, and is eventually broken. Um, but in this page, it's being used to um, to slowly, slowly increase tension, um, which is emphasized as well through the the color palette of these grays and gray blues, a little bit of red for the character's eyes. Um, and the context of this is the main character going to meet a, um, a suitor under the dead oak tree. But um, the white, I think, breaking that monochrome, that mid-tone to dark monochrome color palette is super effective, especially towards the end of this page. Um, with each beat of each panel and each um, bit of narration, the tension increases bit by bit by bit. And when we hit the white of the eighth panel, where the um, entirely white figure is, 
and then leading us into the ninth panel where there is no text at all, but this this image of um, of the suitor and another another woman under the tree um, in entirely white sets the stage really nicely for again the continuation of the comic um, in which we find out that things are again very wrong. Um, the the next couple of pages escalate into a scene of violence. Um, so I think this this page particularly shows a subtle but steady increase in tension um, and a very effective use of the nine panel grid through the through the breaking it up of, of imagery and narration, uh, character focused imagery and landscape or iconographical focused imagery, leading us then to again that place of, of complete white um, or near near complete white that sort of breaks the rest of the color palette. I'm curious what you think about the center panels on the second and third line and the way that they've framed those two faces. The second... So, so like... These two. Yeah. So I think um, those are some of the... some of the only panels on this page that have the color red. Mm -hmm. Um, And the angle is very similar for both of those faces which I think in the context of what the rest of the comic does, creates almost a, a parallel between the two characters, which does come into play through the story of the comic, it, the story the rest of the comic tells. Um, but I, I think that almost repetition of, of imagery creates another sort of, another rhythm to this page that I think um, breaks the pacing in some way, but it continues the pacing in another way. Yeah. I also always like it. I mean, this is very Comics 101, but having like partial faces Mm -hmm. and the feeling it gives of something being hidden uh, or like mystery or something being complicated is is like a very effective, like you have to be careful. You can't do that on every single page, but it can be a really effective way to communicate a very specific feeling in the reader. Well, that second to last panel also denotes like the movement by... Yeah by placing him all the way in that corner and cropping just the just the tip of the nose. Yeah, this mo- yeah, exactly. Well, when it's, you we're moving that way. Yeah. When you were talking earlier about um, the the lack of panel borders, this one has to have its panel borders. Yeah. I mean, look at how thick those gutters are. They're all solid black, mm-hmm. and yet in the panels themselves there's not a single straight upright black shape anywhere. They're all mm. diagonals going all over the page. Yeah. And that's leading you, that's also giving yes. you that sense of, like, off-kilterness. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. All right. And finally, time to talk about you. Okay. Um, Very different page. Yes. I'm just rotating the image here on Ellen's okay. phone. Thank you. Um, so these, this is a spread from my comic uh, Smallness, uh, which is space fantasy depression in three words. Um, and the I'm mainly talking about the second page, but I think the first page provides uh, important context where uh, this main character is um, is having a phone call with her parents um, and the entire way she's feeling in these pages before the story gets into why she's feeling what she's feeling, she's meant to be very small in in her environment because she has disappointed everyone and she feels like she has disappointed everyone um she through the use of color i wanted to um set her apart from her environment <clears throat> make her feel like an outsider in this place both again with her, her scale compared to the architecture around her um the statue in the first page fourth panel um the st- statue completely towers over her she's by its feet very very small in the panel um, and that continues into the second page where we see um, her anxiety in her, during her phone call, wrapping up the, the phone line, um, which then turns into this abstracted imagery of coils and curls tying into each other, representing her anxiety. Um, but again, landing on that towering statue imagery, which is meant to to emphasize her displacement in in her context her her uh, internal feelings are that she wants to run away and and leave this place 
So I wanted to emphasize that through both through both color palette scale and um, imagery to represent that kind of distress, anxiety, and angst. Um, yeah. yeah. I, I also love panel, how you've used. Sorry. Oh, sorry. No, no, go, go ahead. I love how you've used her hair to also make her feel very flat, frazzled, like the use of hair to denote emotion as like a cartoon bunny or something, mm -hmm. how their ears make them look emotional. Right, right. Um, obviously, like with curly hair, it sticks out all over the place in real life. But in comic form, it's mirroring her twisting up the, the coiled phone cord and... I just really like that mirror. I, I also like really like how her <laughs> private moments are in her own palette. Yes. Um, which is, I mean, I'm, I'm sure it was very intentional and it sort of shows that like, although she is very anxious, like it's sort of emphasizing like this is her personal space, which she's, I mean, it's complicated because of course she isn't comfortable right now, but it's, it's a nice way of dividing kind of the personal from the general. Right. And a lot of her uh, feelings in this comic are, her dealing with external versus internal and perception versus emotion and external perception versus her own perception of what has happened. Um, so I did, I did definitely intentionally um, separate her emotional moments color wise from the environment around her. Yeah. That's very smart. Thank you. It's almost like you're an accomplished professional cartoonist or something. <laughs> <laughs> Me? <laughs> mm. <laughs> All right, I think we're next going on to, yes. Okay. Ronald, would you like to talk about some mangas, please? Yeah, sure, let's talk about some mangas. Um, this is from <clears throat> one of my favorite portions of uh, Domu, which was a um, graphic novel by uh, Katsuhiro Otomo, who is more famous for um, making a comic, Akira, which is kind of like coming up on a notable year for Akira. This story takes place like next year in the comic. But um, Domu is kind of like, it's a, it's a plot boiler. Uh, and I think, or a pot boiler, a plot boiler. Plot I just boiler. came up with the new, yeah, you nice. can use that. <laughs> you can use that plot boiler. Um, yeah, it's like a pot boiler and, and, and it builds tension slowly over like many, many, many pages. <sighs> And it's, uh, I don't want to spoil it, who's seen or who's read Domu? It's kind of hard to get your hands on now, but um, yeah. It's a, it's a, it's very violent, but it's, it's, it's mostly just two intellects, like uh, psych, psychokinetic, telekinetic brains fighting throughout, uh, in, a, in a project, housing project. And like what I like about what Otomo does in this is building up this tension strictly with how he places objects in the space while um, showing how the housing project itself is uh, somewhat spooky, antagonistic, haunted, um, and also uh, how the figures in that space are kind of antagonized you know by each other and the space in this sequence we see a um telepathic telekinetic old man uh amusing himself with the prospect of a um placing a baby on a railing and then having the baby fall <clears throat> um it's it's all right there you can see like okay so in the beginning here we see the space, it's empty. We see the repetition of the, um, the forms uh, leading us. This is weird because like, I actually think this was, a, um, obviously it's a flip. So like, there's actually some editorial magic going on here too. I don't even know how they, you know, how they translated this because it would have been going in the opposite direction in the original. But it works here. Uh, the diagonal lines leading you panel to panel. And like Ultimo is like, once you start to see what he's doing, you know it's um, it's it's obvious, but it's brilliant. Like if you if you, even if you're looking at Akira or any of his other comics, the way he uses diagonals to lead lead the eye, and also the pacing, um, the scale of the figures, uh, give you a sense of their agency <laughs> in the story. You know, like you have this tiny baby, 
and then you have this man like slowly uh, growing in size. And then at the end, the scale of the figures and the face. And you're led up to kind of like one, you know, like on the page turn, which is like, I don't know, he's, he's also brilliant at using page turns. So like um, one of the problems with comics, like design problems is uh, we have some control over time, but not really much. Like in one of the few ways we have control is like on a page turn. And like Ultimo is brilliant at this as well. Um, at any given moment, so for instance, if you open a comic on a um, spread, you could you could ruin a punchline, right? Uh, and Ultimo is careful about putting things that could ruin a punchline in strategic places, you know, as as much as he can. You could always just skip the page, though. So that's one of the beautiful things about comics as well. Also, I specifically want to point out, like, I really love how subtle this is, like the choice he made that you have to really be paying attention to follow. It's not like a dramatic effect to show that this baby is being teleported around. Like you have to kind of put the pieces together yourself and you're mm -hmm. building your own horror, which is mm -hmm. really interesting. Yeah. Comics is choosing the moment. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And he's careful to choose the moments. And that... he's putting a lot of trust in the reader to do the work yeah. of figuring out what's happening, which yeah. is very cool. All it's right. It's essential. Yeah, there's something about comics that I think what's great about this panel is um, you would never assume you could walk into, like, the MoMA and kind of just be versed in sort of, like, the language of art history, right? Like, you, you have to do some work to kind of understand the language. And comics is a lot more egalitarian, but at the same time, there is some work that you may have to do. You may assume that you know how to read a comic, and you may. But like after years of reading comics, it, you might have a more sophisticated uh, reading of things, yeah. right? And maybe be able to enjoy different types of comics. And different comics from different places have a different language. Right? All right. And this is manga, M meant to be read quickly. Right? Now, is this the next page? Yeah, and this is the next page. And like, there's some great stuff here because you have like. You have some poetry, like uh, the beginning of this spread, the two panels at the beginning of the spread, both kind of like, they give you a feeling of like a uh, potentiality of, of outcome, right? Like the, um, the bouquet, you know, hitting the ground, right? And then like, it rhymes with the panel on the spread. We can just skip everything that happens. There's a whole bunch of dialogue here. And like the dialogue comes when the moment is like most pregnant, <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's like he sets you up to read his exposition too, right? <laughs> and then it's like you're and you're going through that, and then like at the end here, you know, at the end of that first page, you have this like, oh man, this is such a great character. Find it, steal it if you have to. <laughs> <laughs> and then the reaction and the baby, you know, what happens? You're right there with the old man. You get to see his expression. You go from like this tiny figure in this space, like smack dab, like this would have been great filmmaking as well. That's another approach, like the difference between Ultimo's uh, style of storytelling is like a cinematic style. Like, and it's not, it's not sort of ubiquitous in manga but this is definitely like his school of storytelling. Um, okay, and so then finally, we see the background falls away, which he's been very careful to, Ultimo does a lot of background sheets, but like in this, this example, he, the economy of it, and it also saves him time, or his assistant probably, <laughs> of drawing the background. And here we're set up with the, the um, sort of, what will become the major conflict in the book between individuals, but the actual, there's actual systemic conflict in this book as well. That's why it's one of my favorite comics. Um, in both popping the figures in that panel on the right with mm. that kind of neutral gray background and also positioning them so their heads are at the same height mm. is such an interesting way of being mm -hmm. like, these are equals in this comic, and mm -hmm. he really wants to make sure you notice that specific panel, which is really, because you can read comics like really fast. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, no, that's great. And manga, especially. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, one one last thing about. Oh, please. One last thing about this is, um, uh, I forget which other comic we were looking at, but was really reckless in how you place the characters in the space. 
in a way that maybe purposefully disorients you around where the characters sit in relationship to each other. Otomo is not doing anything like that. For better or worse, he's very particular about placing the characters in relation sequentially uh, to each other so that you understand where they are in relationship to each other throughout, throughout the sequence, except for this last one where she's looking upwards. Mm -hmm. It's a riddle to me, but anyway. <laughs> <laughs> but it gives a feeling like a, almost like a the scale like where they're eye to eye but in that it gives a feeling that that old man is at an actually a much greater scale than she is right yeah, like he's point. looking down on her right or maybe he's not even contained within his body you know like he's you know but, All right, character yeah. choice for her to make her seem like bigger than her britches or something. Mm, yeah, yeah, yeah. And now it's your turn to talk about your own comics. Yeah, which is like, this is a part I felt is ridiculous because like, I don't know. <laughs> you know um, <laughs> I don't know. So um, this particular portion of the comic, two characters um, are, it's, it's a culmination, right? Of a, like a conflict is finally happening. Um, in this uh, is a woman who works cleaning like corporate offices at night. And this is kind of like her boss, which I don't even know if you can call him a boss, like, but yeah, he's as much as a boss could be a boss. And there are a few things that I wanted to do here. Um, I wanted to show um, hegemony with language. So meaning uh, I wanted to show how language could show familiarity, but also like the different role that switching back and forth in language could play in like a sort of presentation of power. Um, I wanted to do something similar to what Otomo did, which is like kind of showing space, uh, showing a character dwarfed by space, leading up to what you won't see here. You'll have to buy the newspaper, which is the next, the next, uh, the next turnover, right? Um, something pretty explosive happens. Um, I drop out a background as well to kind of emphasize like a sound. Um, and I'm working with scale. Something you can't see from this is uh, I'm also working with repetition and poetry. Um, the panels in this, it's something I did with my comic Prince of Cats is that I, I want to produce, and I, you see it in Emily Carroll's work, and you saw it in Domu as well, using structure to build uh, rhythm and then breaking it or playing around with it. Like comics, I think, is kind of like poetry, right? Uh, there's an economy. Um, that's really all I have to say. I'm not going to run my mouth. I, I recommend checking out this comic because one thing you can't tell from this page in isolation is that this particular layout of this page is one that has been uh, used in a bunch of pages previously and that means that each individual detail that's different in this page and this page specifically is a greater departure than the previous ones which helps indicate to you an important thing is happening now and I also uh, really liked your use of type I love it when people do weird stuff with type so having the that IE at the end almost feel like it's inside the building, which kind of, which I appreciate. It, it, it puts it in the context of like where that sound is coming from. We're far it, away. Yeah, exactly. We're outside of it. It's happening in there. Uh, well, yeah. It also, it also, it sounds and yet it's silence at the same mm -hmm. time because there's a visual barrier between you and, the, and that, that sound effect. Yeah, which also gives you a sense of like the closed, weird, artificial environment of this yeah. office that this is happening in, which again, spoilers will be relevant on a future page. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when I, when I thought of this, I, 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 when I'm in the city and I was working in a building, this building is kind of based on a building I was working across from. And I had the idea for this comic before I started this job, I was storyboarding. And I would look over and I would just, and I just think about the city, like um, it's just, there's so many stories kind of locked away and trapped. And I would watch the people come and clean the floors, you know, and, it, and it's just like, you're looking at their life and what's going on there and you have no idea what's going on. And I, I had seen a Frontline, I think it was Frontline or Dateline, I mixed the two up. I think it was. One of those lines. Yeah, 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 one of those lines. And they were talking about, a lot of, it was during the Me Too thing, 
uh, when it first popped off. And they were talking about how a lot of the labor, like the workers, the women, like, you know, they've been suffering from this stuff for so long, you know, and like sort of uh, a lot of immigrants. And so it just completely changed the way I looked at those glass buildings from the outside at night when the lights are on and it's like, whoa, you know, there's stories going on in there, right? Yeah. And that's kind of like what I wanted to do, like a scream, right? Yeah. Like you can't, you know, you're on the outside. Huh. Yeah. Thank you. All right, Ellen, it's your turn. All right. So the pages that I chose, um, can everybody hear me okay? Is this working? Okay. The pages that I chose are a little uh, simpler as far as the emotion that we're getting across. It's kind of like a play. It's all happening all in the same place. We're all looking at this guy's desk. This is from a book that I'm going to butcher this. I'm so sorry, everybody. Les Pieces de Taches. It's French. I don't know how to speak French. <laughs> I actually can't read this book. And <laughs> um, I got it. It's Quebec Y. I got it in Quebec by David Turgeon and Vincent Giard. And the way that they play with lighting throughout the whole book just blew my hair back. And what's happening in this page is that it's very mundane, but you get the sense of the time spent, he's working all night, through simply the change in lighting. And what's even more impressive is that there are no gray tones or color, it's just stark black, stark white. And as the night progresses, and he's working at his desk, it gets blacker and blacker and heavier and heavier, and it feels so tired. Like, you feel it because it's so heavy. And then all of a sudden, you get the stark white of the sunrise in that last panel. And if you switch to the next spread... Which I can do. We've, we're establishing early morning and it's such a wonderful contrast between the black, black of that guy's office and these long cast shadows of the sun rising over the city. And there's no tone. It's just black and white lines. <laughs> it's incredible. It feels so bright. It, it's, you entirely get that feeling of early morning that you're not ready for that's just blinding you. <laughs> that's some gutsy use of spot black also. It's incredible. I could talk about this for days, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> to add on to that, I really love, um, especially in this spread, how the, um, the use of spot blacks versus where they've left things to implication really help push that feeling of bright early morning, the sun has just risen, um, you're maybe you're not ready for uh, being awake. Especially in this, in this panel down here, oh um, where so many of the buildings are just implied, but you know they're there. You're just waking up, so you, maybe you haven't noticed all the details. Um, mm -hmm. There's a lot of really interesting shorthand here. Yes, it's incredible. Which is very risky to do, but I have no trouble comprehending what I'm looking at, like as I'm looking at this. Like it's yeah, absolutely. It it just establishes a mood really well, and it's a just a perfect example of denoting the passage of time without having a panel that has a caption that says the next morning. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and this is a great example of something I think is really important in cartooning in general which is choice of detail. I think it's so interesting that on that bottom left panel, we have these buildings that are basically three lines vaguely suggesting they're there. But on the right hand panel, we have this very loving rendering of like layers of tape yeah. and band and, and us, you yeah. know, for rent signs or whatever they've been put on that mm -hmm. post. And it's like the cartoonist deciding like which detail is going to really put you in this moment most effectively in this even particular right. space. Even applied for rent signs. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. exactly. It's, yeah. Com it's entirely denoting the setting and the feeling of this city. We're not even, I mean, we're just getting this, this so like, quick subway shot. Like the rendering the texture morning. on the pole, but not the text. Mm -hmm. Like it's just, it's interesting what choices have been made here. Yeah. I have a, I have a question for everyone um, or like a, something, right? Um, and maybe for the audience, like, do you ever think about so it seems, compared to at the very, the artist we saw uh, with tearing up the, um, the projection letters. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, and the use and the function, 
of the numbering on the page, right? Like this mm -hmm. seems to be the cartoonist is recording the time or the right. date when they finish the work. Um, something that's interesting technically about comics is uh, something to think about is like, what is, are we looking at a um, reproduction of an original work or are we looking at an original work, like original work as reproduction? When I see like this date on here, I'm thinking, and the fact that it is just black and white, mm -hmm. we're looking at a reproduction of an original work. Mm. And that's an interesting relationship to comics because I feel like most of the other comics we saw, the reproductions are the original works. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? As in like totally. a sketch versus like, what do you mean by original work in this case? Meaning like if I did a, what would you call like a monograph of like a, of a, an artist's work in a museum, yeah, right? Mm -hmm. it, would be, it would be important to have kind of like the date of when that work was made. Okay, yeah. You know, like it, it's not mm -hmm. an original work, but like if you pick up a copy of Spider-Man, right? The first run of it, Right. That's the original. Right. Everything else is production art. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. This seems like it's like they're, they're images of original works. Yeah. Right? It's interesting, right? Yeah, it's interesting that they're collapsing that because it, and oftentimes in comics, the finished image doesn't even exist outside of the printed form. Mm -hmm. Like there, you know, there's there's a there's an inks panel. There's mm -hmm. a there's a color file, mm -hmm. and they all come together in a printed form. The infinitely right, tweaking it in Photoshop. That, right? Yeah. It seems like the artist is telling me that this is like that the originals, yeah, are you know somewhere else. <laughs> I'm, su I'm super delighted by that because I'm looking at the book right now and every page is dated, mm -hmm. and they're all they. Some of the times the dates like flop around, mm -hmm. so it's definitely the artist being so, like, "I'm done. Mm -hmm. This is what I did." Bringing the book, <laughs> which I think is really fascinating um, as part of process and showing process, which. A particular part of process that is often invisible in finished comics, most of the time, <laughs> is how long they take to draw. Yeah, yeah exactly. No, there's, there's. I, I just saw a couple of pages. One of the dates was um, December 22nd for one page. The next page was January 12th. And, you know, did the artist take a break for the holidays? Maybe. Did it take that long to draw that page? Maybe. But or did just, they do it out of order? Did they do it out of order? Maybe. <laughs> Um, and I think that's just such an interesting look into an often hidden part of making comics in a very small yet kind of still intimate way that just gives a bit more context, but also I think works well with the images themselves, which have this, have this quality, Ronald, as you were saying, like original and, um, and reproduction. And the, I think it's just playing with, with these with comics and the idea of comics and the idea of process and the idea of making mm -hmm. in a really... I mean, what's lovely way. about the way that they're made is that it has a z it, it's produced to be like a zine so that it will look the best when it's photocopied on mm -hmm. a normal photocopier right. and not printed by a publisher. Mm -hmm. All right, Ellen, you're not getting out of talking out of your own art, though. <laughs> 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 well, basically for... Uh, <laughs> My page that I wanted to show is that I directly ripped off of this idea of using lighting to denote the passage of time. In this scene, the character has discovered that her father is lying to her, and so she's waiting for him to get home. <laughs> and I, I just wanted to use the lighting as a means of passage of time and also a means of mood, and I was directly inspired by this book by Turgeon and Giard. I mean, I really like how her line art is largely unchanged except for that last panel where she looks like, like a haunted skull, <laughs> <laughs> which is really appropriate. Uh, and I do like that one panel where you can see the, the actual like outline of the window panes, like that, I feel like that probably Thank felt you. risky to you, but it looks it really did, good on, yeah. The, yeah. That's the kind of thing that's like, you're always like, is this a good idea? Is this gonna look bad? <laughs> trying to think of like the late afternoon where all of the shadows are very long. Yeah, exactly. And I don't feel like I did it as well as Turgeon, but that's what I was trying to accomplish. So we have 10 minutes and I would like to be a jerk and ask you a question to fill up the rest of the time. And y'all can kind of see how much you have to say about this. Real quick question. Oh, please. When you're doing repeats like this, I think it's interesting how people do repetition in panels. Do you have a, do you have like a, what's your process? Do you do, do you do like, do you study each one 
do you make like a, um, do you use a light table? Do you do like a, um, what do you do? I want to make sure that it doesn't look like I've copy pasted. Mm. I def when I, when I pencil, I do it in Photoshop. Mm. So in that instance, I did photo uh, and just copy every single panel, but I did uh, value studies to make sure that I got mm. the passage of time and the values that I wanted correctly. And you but, and I did directly on the page here. Hmm? You're using like an aquarel on the page, like you're using like a wash. Yes, I printed. I print out the blue and you ink pencils, them traditionally, right? And I ink every one traditionally so that they don't look like they're all the same. Mm -hmm. It's very cool. And yeah, they're all. It's all ink washes on watercolor paper. And I'm glad you asked a process question because that's actually what I wanted to ask you all. I mean, we don't. Have, we have about like eight minutes, but just really briefly. So we're talking a lot about all the decisions and thinking that we're making as cartoonists and as readers of comics. So when you're making your own comics, where in the process, in your personal process, are you thinking about this? Are you are you people who script as thumbnails? So you're thinking about it like right from the beginning? Do you go in with a specific thing you want to be communicating? Is it something that's coming in as you're refining your work? Like you start out kind of basic and then you're adding layers of like this kind of visual language into it. Like how are you making these choices and when are you making them personally? Um, well, in this case, there was a script first. So I was reading the script on the page and envisioning how I wanted to, um, I always think of mood first and, and passage of time and trying to figure out how to best denote that and also scene changes and things like that. Um, I mostly, and, and when I'm doing my own work, I also write in script form. So um, I don't thumbnail as I write, I just sit with the scene that I want, and I try to envision like how many pages is it going to take, what like how long do I want to to uh, explore this scene, and um, from there that's when I start kind of actually laying out the panel design and deciding how how I want to portray that. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, in a way, all of the above. Um, I tend to, I always script my comics, and I often um, thumbnail alongside them or immediately after scripting. Um, and with script and thumbnails, I always let them marinate for a long time um, before jumping into pencils. I let them sit, and I sit with them, um, think about them, think about the purpose of the story, which I will have resolved prior to scripting so that there's as little editing sort of on a thematic level as possible when I actually get to making images. Um, so most of my, um, most of the work thinking about how the imagery is going to communicate the story is done just as early as possible. But there are times when I'm working on pencils and I'm like, oh, this would work so much better if I switched it like this. And then I'll scrap that page of pencils or scrap those panels and I'll do something else. Um, so my process tends to be very it's structured in a way where I do all of the thinking um, as soon as possible. But and do you do color thumbs? Like, do you do um, like yes. a like okay. a palette story yes. for yourself? Okay. Every comic color keys for every page um, because oh my gosh. yeah, I, I all of my comics are almost all of my comics are in color, and I um, I do this both for my work and for work that I'm coloring other people's work. But color plays such an integral role in full color comics um, that are communicating any kind of story or thematic um, points, emotional points. I um, believe very strongly that color should be used to further the narrative in some capacity, um, whether that's limited color, full color, spot color, et cetera. Um, so I always do, always, always do color keys. Right. Yep. That Kurt. effort is really clear in the two pages <laughs> yes. that are up. Kurt. Um, so, I actually have kind of a weird process for a comics artist. Um, I spent about 10 years before I came back to comics uh, doing oil painting. And one of the things you do as an oil painter is, especially when you're working in a non-super realistic mode, is that you put something on the painting and then you react to it and you keep moving and you come up with this abstract image. Um, and I have sort of been nursing this pet theory about not wanting to lose the energy in my imagery um, and I frequently find that if I do a lot of prep work, if I do a lot of thumbnails and if I uh, 
draw out on the page in pencil and then go over with inks that I lose a lot of that energy. Um, and so I've been sort of experimenting with one-shot comics where I will um, write and draw them as I put them on the page in as close to finished form as I can. Um, and what that tends to make me do is I tend to like make a panel with some dialogue and then sit there and do the same thing that I would do as a, with a painting and that I'll, I'll sit there for a couple hours before I <laughs> do the next panel um, because I'm trying to figure out all the permutations um, before I put that next panel down. So that's been my process lately. Cool. Ronald? That's cool. I feel like I'm somewhere <laughs> in between these two processes. Um, I normally come up with like a constraint, you yeah. know, to help limit the choices that yeah, I yeah, yeah, make. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I have like a, I have like a high concept and like the high concept will probably be something that there's like five or six of them happening for me at once. And then like when I decide to actually do one, then it's like it's bits of language. You know, at any given moment, I'll just write down bits of language that I like which I may or may not use, you know? And then, uh, and my process is always evolving. Like, I, I feel like I've almost gone back to square one, or like square zero, cause like I'm not going really back to anything um, and trying to build up a way of uh, maintaining that spontaneity, that yeah. sort of, that spark in the work. Um, and sometimes like, a uh, print deadline helps because it's just like well, you take know, it away from me. Yeah, it's like you gotta, you gotta. It's like okay, so it's due when? All right, right. so like I'll, I'll knock it out then. Um, but yeah, I don't write for Prince of Cats. I wrote like a complete script, and actually, one of the only, one of the truest forms of Prince of Cats is just the script because it's got all of the line breaks, you know, because it's written in. Um, it's written, and meter, right? yeah, in meter, like various, various form, depending on the character, but like, yeah, it's all poetry. So, and like in the lettering process, you know, you can't, like, I hadn't thought that through and I was working at, you know, I was working with the big publishers, kind of like an assembly line type of thing. Although I did, you know, ink, pencil ink and color, you know, like at a certain point, like, you know, I get a letterer takes it, you know? Yeah. And I don't work that way anymore. So, yeah, does that answer the question? Yeah, it does. And also, side note, uh, I love the look and feel of hand lettering, but if you are working on something on a deadline, please understand you're signing yourself up for then also fixing that lettering mm -hmm. as copy edits and things come back, mm -hmm. which can take more time than you think it's going to. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, unless you look at the lettering as uh, like art, in which case it's just like all of those mistakes <laughs> are just, you know. I mean, part of, me, part of me looks at comics like, you know, you can look, I think one of the things about lettering is like lettering um, in like the more in the commercial sense, you know, like it is it is literature, but like maybe it's also like Cy Twombly or Jean-Michel Basquiat. Maybe it's just like there's writing on the page. You can read it. Maybe you can't read it. Like, you know, writing all of the marks. I feel like all the marks are game yeah. when it's a comic. As an editor, a lot of the fighting I do with the copy editor is being like, no, no, it's supposed to be like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fine. It's fine. And it's, it's, you know, it's funny. I'm working on a, I'm hand lettering for a mainstream book right now. And it's funny how completely <laughs> forgotten what hand lettering looks like. If you go back to comics in the 60s and 70s, there's all sorts of ugly letters and, and spelling mistakes and weird fixes and stuff. Um, and people expect perfection now from computers and it's very odd to go yep. back. <laughs> Well, everyone, uh, thank you so much for coming to this panel, and thank you so much to our panelists, uh, who all of whom are tabling at this con, so please go and say hello to them and buy their books and uh, talk on the internet about how they're geniuses, and, uh, because they are. And uh, again, thank you so much, and enjoy the rest of the day here at MICE.